Welcome, everyone. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there should be uh, hands out already on, on the canvas if anybody uh, wants to. Okay, so my name is uh, Alex Di Maio. I am uh, the uh, microscopy experimental officer uh, and manager of the Birmingham uh, Advanced Light Microscopy Facility here in, uh, in Biosciences. I run the, the, bio, the microscopy facilities along with a little bit of teaching and uh, uh, imaging analysis. Um, and uh, today I am going to squeeze in, in a little bit less than two hours what is usually a six, seven, eight hours lecture. As you may imagine, microscopy is a, might be very, very wide uh, um, topic, and uh, I will try to give you an overview on what is microscopy uh, today in uh, what are the basics and uh, how do we use it in, uh, in biology mostly. Um, feel free to ask me questions, uh, interrupt me anytime. I don't want to have a barrier between I'm the professor and you are the students. We're the same level. Just let's inter interact with each other. Forgive my weird accent sometimes, but um, uh, yeah, I'll try to make as again as clear as possible. It's it's a little bit uh, it might be long, but I'll, again, I'll, I'll I'll do my best to make it easier. Okay. All right. So uh, the lecture is going to be split in five different parts. A little bit of evolution and anatomy. I'm a little kind of old-fashioned. I want to show you a little bit more uh, how the microscope has been evol evolving in the years. Principles, it's always good to have a, a wide approach to uh, what, are, what are the principles behind microscopy, the techniques, the applications, and finally the imaging analysis. Again, bits and pieces here and there just to give you an overview, okay? So, uh, I always like to show this image because uh, I, I'm always fascinated by, especially this piece of metal here, which is pretty much one of the very first microscopes ever existing. And it's it's basically a device where you put your your, your sample. There should be a pointer here. You put your sample in here and you look through it, and you magnify it x amount of time to just look at the details. So this was uh, centuries ago. Then uh, from this, the microscope has been evolving, uh, improving the resolution, the, 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 the power of magnification um, with a hook microscope up to Galileo, where just in the 17th century was used to look at uh, many different uh, uh, specimens, including animals, uh, rocks, and so forth. Nowadays, the system is quite different, as you can see, from uh, electron microscopes here to single-plane uh, single molecules, microscope, this doesn't work, anyways, and uh, custom-made, where you, you literally online, you buy the bits and pieces, and then you mount it together like the Lego, and you have a microscope. I'm not kidding, it's true. So um, the evolution brought us to a very, very uh, high-tech approach of microscopy. And this is just because we want to ultimately look at the tiniest sample possible, like an atom or a molecule, going through pretty much everything you can possibly think of. So we look at ourselves, our eyes, our ends, you can look at our fingers on the microscope. I've seen many people like, oh, look at my fingers. Or <laughs> going into more details, like blood cells or viruses or bugs. or And all of this can be done with microscopes of different entities. Nowadays, light microscopes are heavily used, super-resolution microscopes that fit in this category pretty much along with electron microscopes that can magnify many, many times, I'll get to the details in a second, to analyze and to look at the morphology 
of, uh, again, particles, not even a simple, just a particle or an atom. So um, I'm sure that everybody knows a microscope, right? I mean, maybe somebody haven't used a microscope. Maybe somebody already has <clears throat> quite in-depth knowledge. So I'm going to go very quickly to how a microscope looks like, <coughs> just because uh, sometimes you may think that you know what it's about, and then you say, oh, actually, I didn't know that. <clears throat> so basically, light microscopy, two different types of microscopes, inverted and upright. They are built in the same way. They are just reshuffling the things in order to look underneath the stage or underneath the sample, sorry, or above the sample. Okay, so let's start with the eyepiece. The eyepiece is composed by uh, lenses that can magnify or cannot magnify depending on, uh, on the type of microscope, but basically allow us to look throughout the microscope with our eyes, without the need of cameras, without the need of detectors, and so forth. Then, uh, underneath the stage, or above the stage, there is a condenser. Condenser is very important, especially for light microscopy, for very uh, basic application, where you don't need any special light or anything like that. And it, what it does is pretty much condenses the light, so focuses the light through a specific point in order to have the best illumination on our sample. <clears throat> okay? The, le the light goes through special lens specific lenses, diaphragm and stuff, and gets into our sample throughout uh, uh, the condenser that we need to set up based on a specific objective. Again, I'm not going into the details yet. Then we have the objectives, again, located in two different positions, but still on the upright and inverted nearby the stage. <clears throat> Objectives can be, <clears throat> it's basically, I consider them the most important bit of the microscope. Without an objective, you won't do any microscopy, regardless the type of object, uh, the, the microscope. It can be a humongous microscope, Fancy light, uh, light sheet where you have lasers, path, and all fancy stuff. But without this guy, nothing would be done. It's good to know a little bit about it, <clears throat> specifically the information that I have here. In this case, we have magnification, we have numerical aperture, we'll go to that in a second. A little bit of information, the, the working distance, so how distant can be the lens to the, hello, to the sample, and more importantly, <clears throat> lenses are, are made of, uh, I mean objective are made of different lenses, and the lenses can be defective physically by uh, um, properties of their own material, glasses, specific coating and stuff. The, defects, the, 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 the problem of the lenses is that uh, you need to focus the light in a specific point to highlight the sample that you're looking at and to give the best light. Now, a defect can modify this, allowing you not to see the detail that you want. I'm talking about <coughs> aberration. All the lenses in microscopy are already corrected for aberration, which means that the defect of the material of the lens is already automatically corrected. But it's good to know because uh, a defect on the lens can change the result of your research. Okay? Finally, only for fluorescent microscopy, again, we'll go to the details in a second, we have the optical filters, sorry. The optical filters are located through the path, so next to the objectives, because they need to modify 
the wavelength of the light in a way that you can look at colors of different kind, depending on what type of samples you're looking at. Can be, filters usually ha have an emission and an excitation part where the light is bended in a way that is going to go into the sample and the sample will emit back light through the fluorescent property, <clears throat> okay? Again, many words and many terms are just thrown in as is. I will go to them in a second, okay? Principles. <clears throat> as I showed you, in a microscope, there are lenses, filters, and so forth. So the light inside a microscope or outside in those uh, open microscopes they always, always, the light always go through different lenses, through different pieces of glasses, through different beam splitters, and so forth. So, throughout the light path, there are always different type of steps where the light changes its direction in order to maximize the intensity and the power at the specimen level. Okay, so it's always very good. It's always important to know the light path, where the light is coming from, and where it, it's going, okay? Passing through lenses, the light, as I said, deviates its path. And most of the time, what we see is a changing of direction. <clears throat> now, a normal lens, even a magnified lens from your desk, would convey the light into a point, which is called the focal point, that will give you everything sharp and everything uh, in focus. So where the light rays convey into the point. The focal point <coughs> represents, again, the focal length, length of, of the of of the sample, and of course the shorter one, the higher would give the magnification of, of your sample. What is the magnification? <clears throat> now generally with a, with a normal magnifying glass, we can magnify, we can see bigger stuff, bigger details, roughly around 250 millimeters from our eyes, age dependent. But it's always considered as a one-time magnification. So, I mean, are magnified only one time. Now, if we want to go a little bit more in details and doing some math, <clears throat> we know we can define our magnification by the ratio between the distance between our eyes and the lens versus the distance between, sorry, between our lens and the subject, okay? Now, this is, as a, again, it's a general concept for magnification. So using uh, our lens, in this case my glasses, to magnify and to change the size of our sample. In microscopy, we are talking in a slightly different way, but still the same, same concept. As I said, we go through lenses, so the light path goes in, through different paths uh, and different pieces of glass, in a sense. And that's why <clears throat> the microscope are called uh, compound microscopes as a general term, because the light goes through, uh, because we magnify through different uh, uh, lenses at the ocular <clears throat> or at the eyepieces, and most importantly, at the objective. So the formula is slightly different. I don't pretend, I don't want you to memorize it, but just to give you an idea on what are the components of the magnification of a microscope, okay? Now, <clears throat> if I use the light <clears throat> through a lens, not only I can magnify, but I can also see different shades of light. Now, as a property of a lens, 
the light can be can pass through the lens or can be reflected. And this is quite important in microscopy especially because uh, we want to know where the light is going to make sure that we magnify and we observe what we want to observe. Okay. And uh, more importantly, in terms of principles, we want to know how wide or narrow is the angle that the light, the transmitted light, will go through the lens. <coughs> and the reason is uh, that all those properties are, again, written down on the, on the objective, and we, need to, we want to select a specific objective to look at a specific thing. Now, <coughs> len, la, the light, especially the white light, so the light that we use to illuminate the object, the, the object can be bent in many different ways, but more importantly, can generate different colors. So the property of dispersion of the light allow us to use the light, one single source of light, to separate in different colors the light in order to visualize, again, specific details of our sample. And this is where the filters sit. The, what I, what I, the, 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 the filters I was showing you before have exactly this property. We have a light coming from an external source, goes into the microscope, get refracted, deflected, and then the light can be dispersed in specific colors. <coughs> Now, uh, the bending of the light is important, physically speaking, because it uh, gives us an idea on how fast or slow the light goes with the lenses. Okay? And this is uh, one of the crucial aspects of uh, microscopy which is refer referred to the refractive index, okay? The refractive index is very, very important to know, and by my ex in, in my experience, being a, a facility manager, when I need to train users, most of the time, 97% of the time, people don't have any clue on what the refractive index is, which is understandable in a sense, but on the other side, <clears throat> when I explain what it is, Ah, oh, that's right. That's the answer I get. Why it's, imp why it's important? Again, it's a number that describes how fast is the light into a media, into a lens, into a piece of glass, into a water, or, uh, or into the sand. In this example, my refractive index is the same, forget about the number, just is the same within the different layers where the light is coming through. We have the objective, we have the oil, we have the cover slip, we have the sample in the media, and the light goes straight to the point highlighting our, our sample in the best way, because the refractive index is pretty much the same. If the refractive index is different within uh, each single component of the light path, then the light will be bent in a different way, and uh, whatever we see, it's not going to be focus, it's not going to be sharp, it's not going to give us information, the information that we want. So basically, the concept behind the refractive index is that uh, this property needs to be the same, or at least uh, the value of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of 
the refractive index needs to be the same throughout all the components that are crossing our light. This is important, again, because uh, when, you are when you are planning an experiment, you are here. You are preparing your sample, and you want to know which is the media that you want to use. What type of approach do you want to have in order to have the best light <coughs> looking at your sample, uh, um, uh, magnified your sample? So, sometimes I have uh, users that come to me with a dry lens, with a dry sample. The dry means that I cannot, I need to use uh, uh, air objective, so air here in my sample, air here, but still, I have glass in between, but the, the refractive index is different. So, uh, some, some other times I have people saying, uh, I have a very, very powerful media, which is, uh, has a refractive index on such and such, and I want to use a, a specific objective, but I don't know which one. So I go back to the my objective, and I we look at the numerical uh, refractive index of the objective, and therefore we can look at the sample and set up the microscope in the best way. And this is an example. <clears throat> the same sample using one objective with these properties. It's an oil objective, but again. The refractive index in here is different between uh, sample, media, glass, media of the objective, and lenses in the, in the objective. Whereas in here, all the refractive index match. So this is pretty much a very common scenario where, oh, I cannot focus my sample. But the focus is there. It's the light that going, is going in different ways. It's going in different... Uh, in different light paths, because uh, the properties of the lens allow the light to go slower on some media and faster in other media, having a different uh, a refractive index different. <coughs> okay, am I going too slow, too fast? Am I clear? Questions? Cool. <coughs> This is what I've mentioned before, aberrations. This is going a little bit, a little bit too, too far from the basic microscopy, but just want to give you an, a, a, an idea on uh, always looking at the properties of the objective. The aberration is, again, a property of the glass of the lens that you cannot change, but you can correct within the lens. And, it's, uh, and it can be a chromatic aberration, or it can be um, a spherical aberration. Both of them are, I think the spherical is on the next slide. No, yes. Or, and both of them can are automatically corrected within the objective, okay? Don't be scared about the math here. Nothing really, really uh, complicated, but more importantly, nothing that needs to be remembered. But what I want to give you is the meaning behind it. Uh, we talk about refractive index, which is the property of the light that uh, passes through different medias. The numerical apertures is another dimensionless number, very, very important in microscopy. And this is actually a numerical aperture that it's always, uh, um, um, that goes always together with the magnification. If you look at the, sorry, just let me skip for a second in here. 60x magnification. 1.4 numerical aperture. This way is the best way to identify an, ob an objective. Regardless, everything else 
This is what is the most important one. How much you can quantify and how much light can give you into the sample. Why? <coughs> Excuse me. Because the numerical aperture tells you how much light you have between the focal point and your lens. Okay? And it's proportional to the refractive index, which is property of the light that goes through a media. And the angle of the light, half of the angle of the light, of the conical light that, that hits your sample. Okay? Now, the numerical aperture, <coughs> it's also important because it gives you an indication of the resolution. Hold on on this, on this definition. We'll get into that in a second. So, a low numerical aperture means that uh, I have relatively low amount of light. And this is classic, typical of uh, low magnification objective, like a five times, a ten times. You can't see, <coughs> but you have very, very little light. If I increase the magnification or the resolving power to a, <coughs> excuse me, to a 40 times, compared to 10 times, the numerical aperture is higher and the light, the amount of light is higher. If I go 100 times, I have higher numerical aperture and much more light hitting my sample, which means that I can resolve my sample is a much better way, not only make it bigger because I'm increasing the magnification, but I'm increasing the amount of light. And therefore, I look at my sample in a much, much better way. And keep in mind, again, that it also depends on the refractive index, on whatever it's in the path between your sample and the objective. <coughs> so, I was talking about, I just mentioned resolution, okay? As I said before, I want to, we want to use microscopes because we want to magnify and we want to make sure that whatever we see, it's clear, it's what we are looking for, and uh, it's what we need to answer our scientific questions. But most of the time, we cannot uh, see clearly if uh, there is a difference between one sample and the other, one, ob one object and the other. And this is due to the resolution. So the resolution is defined as the limit for the smallest resolvable distance between two points. Okay, what I mean with this? <clears throat> this is a very, very low resolution. I cannot discern anything in here. So I have one single point, but I don't know the details because uh, I cannot resolve much better. Much, I cannot resolve much in here. If I increase the resolution, the two points or different points are more resolved. So our, the details are much better. So this is really important, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about the resolution in a second, because uh, most of the time we, we tend to think about the magnification, and that's it. We don't always think about resolution. So I want to see a microcell, or I want to see a platelet 
Okay, I use a hundred times objective. Fine. But is the resolution that that objective good enough for that or not? Do I see two different cells or do I see a blob? Oh, that's my cell. What about two overlapping cells or two cells that are close to each other but I don't dis discern the two details? <clears throat> uh, few more for, uh, ma uh, mathematical uh, formulas and I'm done. This is important. It's one of the, say, the, 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 the crucial concept on, in microscopy, which is the diffraction limit. <clears throat> so if I have two objects, again, two cells or two nanoparticles or anything, the limit <clears throat> that I define where I can see the two different entities separately enough is called a diffraction limit. Okay, and it was postulated by Ernst Abbs in uh, Ab in uh, 18, no, it was 19, 1890 something. Okay, <clears throat> and this is the formula. So the distance, the smaller resolvable unit is dependent on the numerical aperture, which is dependent on the refractive index, and the wavelength. So the, the amount of light that we use to shine our sun. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in a in a normal microscope, a normal uh, wide field microscope, the diffraction limit is very very high, which means that if we use a tiny tiny object, we won't be able to resolve them. We won't be able to discern if uh, the blob that we see, it's actually two cells, one cell, or 50 cells. In a confocal microscope, we'll get to that in a second, the diffraction limit goes around 200 nanometers. So particles that are distant uh, between uh, anything between 180 nanometers be, uh, below won't be resolved, so we, you won't be able to see that. <clears throat> uh, the last definition I want to give you before going into a more fun stuff is the point spread function. This is uh, a concept that is very, very useful in a super resolution microscopy where you basically are looking at an object and uh, this object has a shape in three dimensions x y and z that will give you the right resolution at a given objective and uh, laser power or light power okay so it's a three dimensional <coughs> light distribution into a point. And why it's important? Uh, sorry. It's important because uh, if actually, sorry, let's go this way. <coughs> it's important because uh, if I see two points, function, two points clearly enough separated one to each other, that means that the resolution that I need, it's good for that for that. Uh, uh, object, and therefore the objective and the microscope that I'm using, it's the appropriate one to to look at my at my sample. Okay, so uh, again, the point spread function allows you to discern two different spots into a microscope that are separated apart between. Uh, 200 nanometers and uh, 100 nanometers. Let's take a quick break. In five minutes, we'll move on to another portion of the lecture. If you have any questions, of course, let me know.
Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe with this one. Yeah. Objective. Yeah. And uh, are you sure you have a hundred times uh, lens? Because they, they, they usually the the eye piece, yeah, the eye lens, it cannot. It's difficult to be a hundred. It's very very hard. I, yeah, just I just uh, give you an example. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Well, then uh, in this case, you need to multiply the distance between uh, yes exactly your lens this distance and this distance okay assuming pretending that the lens is here this distance and this distance in theory if you take an image of uh, with a camera whatever camera then uh, we, you can calculate the number of uh, the dimension of your sample by using the pixels of your camera, of your image, given by your camera. Okay. If your camera is uh, 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, then your image is going to be 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, then uh, you can retract, re retrieve the, the image, the size of the image by the number of pixels. Imagine if you have a grid of pixels, 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, and then your image is fits on the grid, then you can calculate the amount of, uh, of pixels that covers your sample. If you want it in pixels, or any, whatever it is. If you want it in micro, then uh, the, you will have to measure with a micrometer your image and then use this formula to see which one of those they will measure in, in terms of uh, because this is an empirical number so that's why without the micrometer you won't be able to see most of the time if you have um, uh, uh, no, let me let me draw let me draw here. Sometimes you have a, a, a glass slide, and in here you have a micro. Okay, so you take a picture of this, and then you take a picture of your sample, and then you use this one as a scale bar. Okay, because this is going to be regardless the lenses and the distance between your eyes and your and your and your objective. This is going to be the true distance between your sample um, of, of your sample. Okay. Now, if you want to go more uh, more in details, you can. Uh, well, all you can do in pixels, as I said, but you can measure this one and apply this one to know about 400 times 100 
What is the unit that you have in here? Okay, I have I have a couple of those if you want if you want to try because without this and without any other unit you won't be able to do it. You need a unit. You need you need a, a, a specific unit that tells you, okay, this is a microphone, this is a microphone, this is a microphone, or something, and then you do that. Uh, I didn't use the, this kind of microphone. Can mm -hmm. you tell me what the general units we, uh, we use? Microns. 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 So usually it's the more the widest uh, uh, unit is microns. And you can use nanometers, but with that we go into very, very high resolution. Okay. Let me know if, if you need one of those. I can, I can, I can give it to you, and then you can do some measurements. Because at that point, once you have it, you can store it, and every time you need to do measurements, you have the the actual uh, ruler. Okay. Cool. Hey. Did you record the electron? No, the what? Uh, did you record the electron? Um, yeah, no, the, the, it's already yeah, recorded. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just one more question. Sure, yeah, yeah, no problem. Cool. Okay, <clears throat> so... Right, just to just to recap a little bit. Oh, just first of all, uh, there should be a sign sheets around. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. If you can get back to me after that, would be great. Uh, so, just to recap a little bit, uh, like besides the how a microscope it's, it works, what we need to know in microscopy is mostly to know where the light goes within our instrument and what are the properties of this instrument to make sure that we select our best instrument. Sometimes, uh, in my experience, users come to me and say, look, I need to look at this. And I ask them, okay, what is the, the size of this object? What is, what is the size of this? Well, it's roughly three microns. I said, okay, well, uh, we have microscopes to do that. We can try, and then, uh, but then uh, we have the problem of uh, the type of sample, which is not a non-biological sample. It's a piece of gold, it's a piece of plastic, it's uh, a soap uh, granule or something. So we have issues of refractive index uh, matching uh, the, the, the components of the microscope. We have issues on... Uh, uh, looking at the dispersion of the light, and so forth. Then uh, some other user come to me and say, well, I have this sample, and it's uh, 20 nanometers, and I need to look at it. And I said, okay, well, we don't have the capabilities to do that because it's too small. So in few words, what I'm trying to say is uh, it's good to know what type of answer you need to give to your scientific question and uh, good to know what are the micros microscopy applications based on the um, uh, on the concept that we've been talking about in order to get your perfect answer. Okay. So I want to go through some microscopy techniques. Some of them are basic. Uh, um, really basic microscopy techniques like uh, uh, DIC and phase contrast. Probably some of you already heard about them. And then uh, uh, spend a little bit more time on what is the fluorescent microscopy and what type of application can we do with fluorescent microscopy. <clears throat> so, uh, oh, and uh, I'll mention a little bit about electron microscopy because I think... Uh, it's um, although it's a niche application, it's it's really really powerful and uh, uh, it's worth mentioning, anyways. Okay, so uh, 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 as a basic microscopy, I usually uh, define uh, the bright field microscopy. Just to get it, it work. 
um, which basically is the application where the light is, it comes from a normal light bulb. It's not normal, but it's, it's, uh, it looks like a normal light bulb. And uh, which is a, a light so that produces so-called color illumination, I'm not gonna go into details, but will allow you to see uh, structures details, structural details, and um, without the need of a specific staining, without any dyes, without, with, without need, the need of uh, any specific uh, uh, compound in your cells. Within the bright field illumination, we have phase contrast, which is a technique that allows us to, to, to look at the um, structural details by um, different uh, uh, phases of the light. And uh, uh, DIC, which is very similar, but uh, um, uses a diffraction and refraction of the lenses. And then fluorescent microscopy that has a, uh, a, a tells, tells you already by the name what it's about. Let's start with the, uh, the contour opposites. So this is an example of bright field, face contour, and DAC. And you can see that we don't need a staining. We just uh, need lenses to magnify again and to give some contrast to our sample in order to highlight the structural details. Okay. <clears throat> now the DIC, which is the um, different interference contrast, gives you this type of visualization out of a normal bright field uh, uh, image because of a specific disposition of the lenses inside the microscope. We have a polarizer, we have a prism, the condenser, an objective, and an analyzer that will allow you to uh, will allow the light to be split it in two way, into uh, ways, and uh, eventually gives you giving you this type of light where you have a shade a bright shade on one side and a darker shade on the other side, and this is the the difference in the contrast of the two wavelengths. Then the phase contrast, <clears throat> uh, it's slightly similar, but again, gives you a, a specific uh, uh, re uh, result by um, having the light being filtered in these uh, specific rings where the light is not going to a point for the condenser, but it's going to a cone, in a cylinder. So the phase ring hides centrally the light and then gets into the condenser in a specific way, giving you different in terms of phase. <clears throat> okay. Then we are going to the wonderful world of the colors, where fluorescent microscopy, which is the I would say probably the most uh, the widest application in microscopy nowadays. Uh, where we pretty much use a light source that hits a protein or a dye, and this dye or protein emits naturally some light that is detected by us. Okay, and it's, uh, those are examples. So the concept here is that we are exciting our probe. The excitation of the probe causes a release of photons, and the photons are detected by our eyes or by the camera, giving us specific localization of where the probe is. And this is why fluorescent microscopy is so widely used, because uh, by the use of, again, proteins or dyes, or other type of fluorophores, we can target specific areas of our cells and look at them without any interference. Uh, within the, the range of dyes and proteins, we have already uh, we have we have uh, a 
relatively wide range of colors or wavelengths, to be, to be more technical and more specific, that uh, ranges between uh, uh, 300, uh, 350 nanometers to 900, uh, nanometer, 900 <coughs> nanometers. Um, and those, and this spectrum here, which is called the visible, uh, the, 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 the optical spectrum, uh, which can give us specific uh, um, um, colors, or more, more, more in, in details, specific level of energies that will allow that where we assign specific colors in order to see different uh, uh, different type of uh, of proteins or different uh, different dyes within the same object. In order to do that, we need to, again, excite with a light source, and then the actual protein or dye will emit some light. Excitation and emission are, the, uh, I would say, uh, it's, it's probably the, 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 the basic concept of, of fluorescent microscopy, because it's... Uh, um, it's where all our light lays uh, in our uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the microscope. So we have an excitation wavelength, which can be any sort of wavelength within this range, that will again excite our protein or our dye. We need to know, though, the number of excitation and the number of emission in order to set up the microscope properly and in order to see something. And this is opens a lot of different questions and a lot of different applications on how to select the best combination of excitation and emission in order to highlight our sample without issues. And how do we choose it? We have to... They need to be bright, first of all. They, well, we want a lot of light out of them. Uh, and stable, because uh, we don't want to have uh, a lot of bleaching immediately after um, excitation. Uh, if we use uh, shorter wavelengths, we have better resolution because of the uh, Rayleigh criterion that I showed you before. However, longer wavelengths will give you less photobleaching and photo phototoxicity. So again, it's just a matter of uh, meeting a compromise between uh, do I want to fry myself or yes? What's photobleaching? Photobleaching, I'll, I'll get back to you in a second. Um, you want to have a compromise, a good compromise between uh, uh, a good stability, good brightness, and uh, the damage of the cell. Photobleaching is damaging your cell or your fluorophore or your protein because it receives too much light, emits too much light, and then the energy is gone. So the photo, the photo bleaching is a phenomenon where you don't see any more signal out of your fluorophore because uh, the, there is no more, no more energy to release the photon. There are techniques that will allow you to recover the bleaching, but it's a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> and when you finish it, that's it, your sample is finished? Again, there are, there are techniques where you can uh, recover it by uh, using a different light that will recharge the fluorophore. Or there are um, uh, probes, chemical probes, where they will give you a different type of light because they don't require that excitation anymore, but you can use another excitation. So if you use, uh, if you use only this, you're going to bleach it, but if you use this one, it's going to be fine because the energy here can be dispersed. It's wider anyway. Uh, another very important pro uh, problem or criteria to select your fluorophore is the overlapping. Let's say that I want to stain, I want to look at my cell 
and uh, I want to look at three different components of my cell. Let's say nuclei, mitochondria, and uh, membrane. Okay. If I want to look at those components <coughs> simultaneously, I need to use three different colors. Okay. Three different colors means three different excitation and emission combination. If I use an excitation for the blue, for instance, for the my nuclei, I have an emission which is um, uh, which is uh, on the 400 nanometers. If I use the green to highlight my mitochondria, the green is relatively close to my blue. So the excitation that I use in here may also hit the green. So I may also see nuclei with the green light, and so forth. And I use the mitochondria in red, but it's still relatively close to the excitation value of the green. So in few words, the selection of the, of the dyes may, that needs to be properly uh, analyzed because uh, you don't want to have overlapping of your fluorophores one to another, especially when you need to do colocalization analysis. You want to see if a protein colocalizes or not, and you're using green and yellow. So you are exciting in green and yellow. More likely, the green and the yellow would be, uh, would be in both proteins, and you won't be able to discern which one is which. And that's why for colocalization analysis, the best way is using the blue, and stay away from the blue as much as possible and use the red. Okay. I'm talking about, <clears throat> I'm talking in a very simple way, uh, but my terminology may be much more complicated <clears throat> using wavelengths and numbers. In a microscope, all of this translates in uh, pretty much this diagram. We have our light source, the lamp. We have uh, an excitation filter that excites the light for our, let's say, green. So in a specific uh, 400 nanometers, let's say. The light goes through my objective and hits my sample. And I see green light because uh, the sample in green, the GFP, the green fluorescent protein, for instance, is emitting light that gets into the emission filter to be able to be detected by my eyes or by my camera. Same thing with the red. The same type of lamp or the same type of light source gets into the nucleic filter, blah, 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 hits my red fluorescent protein gets emitted here, refractive here, sorry, gets into the green, the red filter, and then it's red under my eyes, okay? And so forth. The light source is always one, but the filters, and more likely, and more, more importantly, the proteins here, give me different type of wavelength, and therefore different type of colors. Okay. Um, okay. This is how it looks like. Uh, this is in our facility. So, inverted microscope, source of light, one or two, depending on which light. This is the normal bright light. This is the fluorescent light, powered by this, and uh, the computer for the camera, which is here. Now, I, uh, nowadays, um, with, the, with the LED, um, using LED, this type of light, which is uh, the arc lamp on there, can also be selected by colors. So we don't need uh, a specific filters here because we already have a green light shining our green, green uh, um, fluorophore or protein, but we still need an emission filter to be able to cut off everything else but the green or whatever other colors. This is a similar microscope because it's still inverted, but it's a confocal microscope. So uh, it's, uh, again, one of our systems in the facility, but as you see, it's much more complicated, not because there are two screens, 
but because uh, there is a laser power, there is a, the, it's, uh, the, the light that doesn't come from a bulb, but it comes from a laser. There are different uh, 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 power units and, and boards to, to, to select the, the light, and, and without, without going into details, it's much more complicated. But why do I use it? Yes. Say again? Oh, so, okay, thanks for telling me. So, do it's still going? Should I? Sorry, it's my first time with Panopto, so I'm not sure. Should I stop and uh, do it again? Just leave it? Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. Next, uh, remind me now in the next 10 minutes, we'll double check. Okay. Okay. So, um, we, why, uh, what is a confocal microscope? Well, actually, let's, let's put it in this way. What, um, uh, why would I need the confocal microscopy? What is a confocal uh, microscopy used for? It's written there. It's used mostly for co-localization or localization of proteins. As I said, you have GFP, green fluorescent protein, blue F uh, BFP, uh, blue fluorescent protein, and so forth co-localizing into a specific spot, and you want to look at them and analyze them, and so forth. Or you want to do multiple fluorescent stainings, so you have, uh, again, uh, nanoparticle outside that you want to see if they're going inside the cell. You want uh, to highlight different portion of the cell, um, and, and so forth. Uh, granted, I'm talking about a cell because it's pretty much my unit of measurement, but this can be a large piece of tissue, it can be a drosophila uh, um, neural cord, or it can be a, a, a daphnia, or it can be any other animal. So as long as it's stained with fluorescent dyes or proteins, it's fine, but I'm using the cell as a general example. I can do three-dimensional three visualization. So not necessarily, if this is my cell, not, not necessarily I'm looking in here. I want to look throughout my old cell because it's still a three-dimensional unit. So I want to be able to make sure that I can see the entire volume of the cell. And of course, I want to quantify. Remember that we'll go through that later on towards the end of the, set of the lecture. But remember that... Uh, Quantification is crucial in microscopy. Uh, 10 years ago, or maybe even, even 15 years ago, you could publish easily a, a, a nice picture on a paper, and nobody would tell you, oh, this is nice, yes, fine. Now, if you just publish one image, that would say, so what? They always want some quantification. They always want a graph next to an image because you want to show that your green is co-localizing with blue, but they also want to see how much is co-localizing or what's the percentage or what's the meaning of it and so forth. So always add quantification. Again, we'll go through that later in our um, uh, imaging analysis uh, portion. When do we use it? <clears throat> We use it when we our structure are uh, bigger than 200 nanometers. And this is why? Because of the? No. Resolution. Because the diffraction limit of a confocal microscope is roughly around 200 nanometers, which means that my two proteins that our distance 100 nanometers won't be able to see them. We won't be able to see them separately. We will be able to see them together, but I need to know that they are separate. If I need to know they're separate and they're smaller, I microscopy is not my guy. 
It's mostly used on cell and developmental biology, uh, in tissue biology, and in single molecule imaging, imaging, although this is kind of borderline because uh, it depends on the resolution limit anyways. In a similar way, <coughs> as I showed you before, the confocal microscope <coughs> uses pretty much the same light path. We have, uh, uh, no, this is, we have a light source, in this case it's a laser, gets diffracted by a mirror. We have an excitation filter in here. Hits my sample. The sample emits some light because it receives energy from the laser. The photon will travel through the microscope. Again, remember all the lenses. This is a very simple, simplistic way to do it, but there are so many lenses in a confocal microscope. And then gets into the photomultiplier detector. Now, it looks very similar, but there is a specific detail here that allow us to make it unique from uh, any other microscope. If I, this is called the pinhole aperture. If I use a normal microscope, oops. if I use a normal microscope, all the light that is coming from my sample will go through the microscope and will get into that, okay, without this. So all the light that is coming from everything is going to hit there. Which means that if this is again my cell and I'm looking into here, if you're looking in through this side, you're looking at your sample here, but you're also looking at the light coming from here and from here. But I want only this. So I want to cut optically my cell to see only this without the noise of this and this. Okay? Even if this is an, another example. So the off-focus light is blocked by the pinhole and only the light that I'm focusing on my sample is coming through. Uh, I'll skip this one for a moment. That's an example. I'm looking at the, this biofilm, and this is the depth of light, and I'm focusing here. So I see some of the dots in focus, some others blurry. But because the light is coming throughout my entire biofilm, if I apply the pinhole, all the light from the background, it's hidden, it's blocked. And I see only the image from the focal plane. Okay. In a much more fancy or nicer way, this is the wide field, no pinhole, and this is the pinhole. Okay, so the light coming from all the noise, the background noise, is hidden by the pinhole. And I see clearly nuclei, membrane, and uh, other stains. Whereas in here, I see the colors, fine, but it doesn't tell me, tell me anything. Uh, right, this is an example <clears throat> where, no, oh. I spoiled the surprise. Um, I'm looking at the mitotic spindle, okay, standing by with tubulin. tubulin. Uh, you can see here the entire image that is reconstructed by a next amount of layers that I've been taking throughout my sample. And this is the visualization. Each frame, it's an image taken throughout the z-axis. And this is why it's called z-stack. Come on, don't spoil them. So, ah, oh gosh. Fine, whatever. So, 
this is another sample that I took uh, in collaboration with, uh, with another guy in, uh, in, uh, in medical school. So this, those are two cells, okay, that I, we did the reconstruction in three dimensions because uh, we wanted to look at the different distribution of those white dots or, and, and red dots throughout the chart. Oh, come on. Gosh. <laughs> Let me talk. Sorry, guys. The power of PowerPoint as we were. Anyways, how did, I, how did we do this? Again, our cell, layer by layer, taking down, uh, imaging uh, from the bottom to the top of the cell, and reconstructing in three dimension. You got offended, fine, whatever. Okay, questions? Am I clear? So again, Z stack, it's the method that we use in confocal microscopy. Z because we are going through the Z axis, frame by frame, image, um, optical frame by optical frame, to acquire each frame without noise from the surrounding frames. Okay. Right. Confocal microscopy is most, it's, uh, it's known also as a single photomicroscopy because uh, the laser goes to the sample, the sample and gets excited. Well, the fluorophore in the sample excites and then uh, emits one photon that is uh, detected by the camera. But <clears throat> in confocal microscopy, the fo sometimes with bigger samples, with larger and uh, thick samples, the single photon is not enough. It's not enough to go through out the entire sample because uh, the noise and the energy that this photon has is not enough to highlight the details. And that's why we use a two photon microscopy which is a slightly different application. It's still considered as a confocal, but it's mostly used <coughs> excuse me, for thicker samples. When I want to really highlight all the details in a sample that I cannot uh, um, dissect further down. Okay. Um, okay, well, I'm, I'm not going into details, but... <coughs> Um, the, the, the concept in here is, the, is uh, that we are, we, are we, we need to use a, a much higher intensity of the laser and therefore uh, higher wavelengths. Okay, so we need a specific type of equipment which is not uh, the one that I showed you before but it's roughly similar. In few words, <coughs> uh, we want to use a, a high le higher energy, but uh, um, split it in two. So we want to, to, to use two different photons on low energy, also to avoid the photo bleaching and the phototoxicity, <laughs> as I said. So uh, that's another e e example of uh, confocal, single photon and two photon. And it's not that great, I prefer the previous one, but anyways, uh, we're pretty much splitting in two the single photon uh, in order to have two lower energy photons. Okay. Uh, so if confocal microscopy <coughs> will allow me to look at the three-dimensional reconstruction of the cell or of my sample, <coughs> so going through pretty much the entire depth of my cell, the turf microscopy allow me to look at uh, the, uh, the interface between uh, my sample and the support. Again, this is uh, the wide field, the epifluorescence, so I see everything. <coughs> but if I change with a, with a single light source that goes straight up, if I change the angle of the laser, I can see only a specific portion of my cell 
that is adhering on the substrate. Okay. So turf microscopy works in this way, basically. You have a laser beam <coughs> that goes through the objective. Uh, it's deviated by an angle, a specific angle. This angle will create an evanescent field that it's going to have it's going to have it's going to um, have just a very very short distance allowing to see only the again the interface between the support and the cell um, well yeah I just already this that say that um, if we go back to the no, the, the, the theory, uh, initial theory, where we are, was talking about numerical aperture and the refractive index, again, the refractive index here has a crucial role because uh, the vanishing wave that I'm creating with the angle of my laser needs to be, uh, it's proportional to, um, uh, in, uh, sorry, it depends on, uh, on the media where my cells are, okay? In order, however, to uh, take, uh, to, to, to create this evanescent wave, the um, numerical aperture, I'm sorry, the refractive index needs to be different from uh, the Composite or the support and the media. And in this case, 1.5 is the classic numerical aperture for the glass, and uh, 1.3, 1.38 on a living cell media. So we are not talking about uh, water, we are talking about media, live cell media with salts and other things. Uh, the, important, the important part here is that. The difference of numerical aperture uh, of the refractive indexes allow us to have a thicker or thinner evanescent wave, and therefore allowing us to have much more penetration than than uh, um, I mean the best penetration of the penetration depth into the into the sample. Uh, The best penetration means that uh, the signal to noise ratio will be much higher and therefore uh, having a much cleaner image out of, of, my, of my sample and uh, uh, resolving in a possibly high power, depending on the microscope and of the objective, uh, with the minimal noise. Um, the application for turf are quite restricted because, again, we are looking at the interface, so we are not looking at the entire sample. So whatever is on top of the cell is not visible. But <coughs> it's very useful for endocytosis, for instance. You want to look at the cell moving, um, uh, behaving in a certain way, uh, with endocytic markers or with drugs that you, want, that you need to deliver to the cell in order to have it dying or, or, or surviving or whatever. Um, uh, dynamics, so you want to see the inter, in, intercellular interactions, uh, coal mi co growth cone migration, focal adhesions, and again, single molecule behavior in a, in a specific uh, range of... Uh, um, uh, resolution. Okay. Uh, why this is here? I don't know. Okay. Sorry, this is shouldn't be okay. In images, this is uh, the same cell, kind of ugly. Yeah. Bright field, normal, no staining, just a structure. In a normal epifluorescent microscope, no confocal, but just a norm. Yes. The evanescent wave comes from the uh, electromagnetic field that the laser
creates when it deviates. So why does it create? Uh, why creates the, the electromagnetic field? Um, that's a good question, which I don't know if I can answer it. But uh, it's a it's a it's a physical principle, where you are shining laser with a specific uh, energy into a, a, a media, glass in this case. The glass refracts the light and then scatter the, the, the light, the laser, in different ways. The scattering of the light is, uh, has energy involved into it. Okay? I'm not sure about what type of energy is it, but there is an energy linked to the light. And this is actually the energy that is Electric field creating magnetic field, similar to that. It's not that because it's not, uh, we are not talking about Faraday's law. We are talking about uh, scattering of electrons into a media. Okay. okay. This scattering of electrons create a field, which is an electromagnetic field, which makes, <coughs> excuse me, the light confined in that specific wave because the, the laser doesn't go straight up and therefore hits the hour sample. It goes into this specific circle, uh, curve, that allow the light to be scattered in different ways and be confined into it. I'm, I don't have a more detailed explanation. I'm, I'm sorry, but yeah, if, if you're interested, I'm, I'm sure that there is a, there's a slide with some material to read it, but I never, never be able to, to fully understand the physics behind it. But I was able to appreciate how cool is it, <clears throat> because uh, it gives you, again, a selection of uh, of uh, of light that hits the sample, and this is another example where you have normal epifluorescent microscope giving you everything but nothing. Confocal, <clears throat> it gives you a decent amount of details. But the more the important details are in turn. This is not a perfect image. Let me see. Yes, there we go. So those are internal uh, um, movements of the cell, of, 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 uh, uh, endocytic, uh, of an endocytic marker that goes up and down inside the cell. And again, I'm, I'm highlighting only the, the, uh, a small portion of the cell. But if I use... This approach with confocal microscopy, I will see a lot of noise because I will highlight all the depth of my cell. And this is another application, cell migration. <clears throat> all, oh, come on. All of this, all of those are cell movements taken on a time-lapse fashion where I see the cell protrusions. I must have done something on the presentation. I don't know what. All the philopodia, lamellopodia, all around, allow us to understand the uh, behavior of the cell moving around. And if you imagine that one with an extra fluorophore, potentially highlighting uh, <coughs> another compartment of the cell, you may have, you may end up having quite pretty images in multicolors. Questions? Am I so good? Okay. Right, so <clears throat> let's move on another technique. This is really cool. This is called um, light sheet or single plane illumination microscopy. And it's been quite revolutionary in the last uh, decade because um, <clears throat> has been able to uh, approach to move microscopy into a very uh, low toxicity approach into uh, uh, in the imaging of large specimen and so, uh, most importantly live images. Um, there are different type of uh, SPIMS system. This is the most uh, known, the, well, the, the, the most famous one which is the commercial one on the dice. So it's, this is the microscope. You don't need, you just need the mouse to click, honestly. 
because it by clicking it opens up the doors and stuff. So it's it's very it's very automated and it's very powerful. Uh, it costs a bunch of money, by the way. But or there are the more fancy one where physics uh, physicists, sorry, uh, together with micro, with microscopists and biologists want to recreate the fact of uh, single plane illumination by custom build their own microscope. And as I said before, online there are there is a kit available for sale where you basically buy the table that has a bunch of different holes where you can screw in lenses and then you buy whatever you want and you build it yourself. What is the principle behind it? <clears throat> so if... Um, with a confocal microscope, or with ter well, turf, it's slightly different, but with con a confocal microscopy, we have a single point illumination. Okay, so our cell, it's uh, hit by a point, a uh, laser point, that uh, allow the fluorophore to emit light, and so forth. This is, however, it might be very toxic, because uh, if you are running a time lapse on a cell, uh, over the night, for instance, uh, heating the sample with the laser all the time might be toxic for the cell, That's more likely for the chlorophyll. In this case, instead of having a point, we have a plane. That's why it's single plane illumination, because uh, on, with a combination of uh, multiple objectives, illumination objective one and illumination objective two, there is a, a plane, the, the, the light forms a plane where the sample, uh, that, that hits the sample and, uh, and the light coming from the sample is detected by two different objectives. <clears throat> the interesting part of this is that the sample, more likely, it's uh, uh, embedded into a, into a um, media. We can have a larvae, we can have a piece of tissue, we can have cells, we can have, I don't know what it is, not explosive, but something. Uh, this sample is uh, literally embedded into an agarose uh, capillary. The capillary moves around, spins around, the sheet of light hits the sample in the 360 degrees movement, recreating the three-dimensional <coughs> Uh, reconstruction of the cell or the tissue and so forth uh, with a very, very low toxicity. And the toxicity is due to the fact that the signal, the energy spread out into a sheet of light instead of being focused into a, into a point. So the, the intensity of the light is pretty much the same, but the power of the light is different in terms of photons, of course. This is an example. So this is a, 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 a Daphnia predator. It's a, I think it's a mosquito larvae. And I stain with red and green. Uh, and uh, it's uh, spinning around. But as you can see, I can catch the three-dimensional reconstruction quite accurate on the entire sample. This was fixed because it was a demo. But I can do this in live samples. And uh, having, if you go online and you Google, um, or in YouTube, actually, uh, Drosophila embryo uh, development, you will see amazing, amazing movements of cells starting from uh, a cluster of cells moving around and forming the entire embryo. So the single plane illumination microscopy is really, really powerful, mostly for developmental biologists, for, uh, um, for lab applications. This is a Daphnia. Uh, anybody know what Daphnia is? I'm just... It's a... It's a um, sorry, it's a... Um, sea, a freshwater um, flea. Okay. <clears throat> right. So, let's move on to uh, a little bit more uh, recent, relatively recent uh, uh, application, which is a super-resolution microscopy. We, uh, there were three Nobel Prizes that dis did, did not discover the technique. They implemented in a way that now it uh, can be widely used in pretty much every 
uh, microscopy facility. <clears throat> the super resolution microscopy <clears throat> allows us to break the diffraction limit and going beyond the 200 nanometers of confocal. Uh, as I said before, the uh, resolution limits are dependent on the uh, distance uh, of, the, of the sample, of the numerical aperture, refractive index, and uh, with the wavelength of light. This is a quite clean and self-explanatory representation of what you can get of a confocal image and a super resolution image. That's it. The, uh, there are a couple of different uh, uh, super resolution techniques. So when, you, when we talk about super resolution, we, not, we, are talking, we need to be careful on, on, on explaining exactly what, we, need, what we, uh, we mean by that. And this is also in light of uh, um, scientific applications. Because you want to, yes, you want to resolve two different particles that are close, uh, very close to each other. But at the same time, you need to know what type of uh, scenario do you need and what type of uh, super resolution microscopy you want. In this case, in this lecture, I'm go just going to touch three different applications, which is actually the mo the wide, the mostly uh, they're mostly used in, in biology, and instead <coughs> seam and storm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, each of them have different resolution limits. We're talking about 50 nanometers XY, 100 nanometers XY, and 20 nanometers XY. Uh, and uh, uh, some of them <coughs> do not require fancy detectors, but just a powerful camera, whereas uh, they instead. Uh, require a, um, a detector like a confocal, basically. <coughs> so, uh, as I showed you before, <coughs> the point spec function is crucial <coughs> to, um, uh, to, to determine what is the, and the amount of overlapping between one sample and the other, one object and the other, and define if the two objects are overlapping or are uh, separated enough to be visible. Okay? Um, as I showed you before, the resolution limit, <coughs> it depends on the numerical aperture. So we can have high numerical aperture and therefore a lot of light going in or low numerical aperture and have less light going in. The light will make a huge, um, the amount of light will make a huge different difference in the resolution because uh, the diffraction limit depends strictly from the wavelength of, uh, that you're using. Um, this is another example <coughs> where in this case, if I resolve this one here, uh, <clears throat> I won't be able to, if I enlarge this, sorry, I won't be able to resolve different portions of my sample, whereas with STORM, I will be able to, to look at a single detail, and we are talking about this one here. <clears throat> okay. Um, the technique behind it especially on, on SIM, it's actually uh, quite clever, to be honest with you, uh, and it doesn't require a massive amount, a, a, a large uh, piece of equipment. Somebody could say, okay, I am doing super resolution microscopy, so I have a super microscope. No, that's wrong. Super resolution microscopy is, can be done with a turf microscope, very simple, but there is a lot of computing behind it. And the computational part is the one that makes, the, uh, that um, retrieve the, the resolution and, uh, and, and the details. In this case, 
in, uh, in uh, structural illumination microscopy, in the microscope, there is a, a simple pattern, which is this one here. Well, actually, let me take it back. Uh, the majority of the commercial microscopes don't have this one. So this is a, a computational approach. You have an unknown pattern, which is uh, the pattern that is detected by the camera. And then uh, uh, you, need, you have a known pattern that is defined by the software. Combining the two, you can retrieve your uh, image. Say, did you sign it? Yeah, okay, cool. Much. Thanks. Sorry. Yep. Um, so the combination of the two patterns, again, computationally, will allow us to reconstruct our, our cell or our object that will then further computation, compute back um, to retrieve the single, the single um, details that we want to know. And uh, <clears throat> the computational part takes in consideration of the, the, lower, the, low, the high frequency and the low frequency uh, frequencies from, uh, from the laser. And in this case, High frequency are not collected by the by the the objective, whereas the low frequencies are collected by the objective. So the combination of the two, along with the combination of the two patterns, will give us our super resolution images. And this is a, another uh, uh, example. So I have a wide field image. So the input of low frequencies. The image is going through a pattern that changes with a known pattern, this is unknown and this is known, and then get computationally uh, deconvolved <coughs> by, uh, by the software. STORM is slightly different because uh, STORM uses, uh, there is a huge chemical approach in the, in the super resolution, in, in, uh, in stochastic <coughs> super resolution because uh, we are <clears throat> activating chemically uh, individual molecules that blink. Okay, the blinking. I have uh, yeah, the blinking that is due to the excitation of the laser and the chemistry behind it will uh, be detected by the computer. that uh, it's going to go at least 20 times 20,000 times of not more computing the blinking and the detection to give us the real super resolution super resolve image okay and this is another example <coughs> where we through the activation or deactivation of the fluoro force we are able to deconvolve and therefore to uh, make sure that all the details are clearly visible and to discern the details of our sample. <clears throat> I'm going quickly through electron microscopy now. So we leave uh, the fluorescent and light microscopy. Ooh, okay. Uh, back for a second. Um, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to go relatively fast in here. Uh, just want to show you this this one here. So the electro electron microscopes are <clears throat> have a different uh, type of approach. We are still talking about super resolution, but we are not. There is no computational in there. There is a there is a um, uh, an electron uh, um, scattering approach which comes from a tungsten filament so the electrons are have much much higher energy compared to the super resolution lasers they go through specific lenses without going into details and then they heat the sample that is treated in a specific way 
allowing the electrons to scatter everywhere and to be detected by a detector. This scattering allow us to look at details that night microscopy won't be able to give us. In this case, we have mitochondria here. This is a, this is a um, oocyte. Nuclei, nucleoli, membrane, quite clean boundaries of the membrane and uh, uh, endoplasmatic reticulum all around. So we can get a lot of information with that. The only problem is that this technique is only for fixed samples. So we cannot do any live imaging at all. Whereas with super resolution microscopy, we can do live imaging as well. Although we want, we will never achieve this grade, this degree of, of detailed details uh, with the super resolution. This is another <clears> oocyte. <throat> Um, I'll, uh, for the sake of time, I'll skip this one because it's a relatively uh, old-fashioned way. I just want to go to scanning electron microscopy. What I showed you before uh, a second ago was transmitted electron microscopy. The, the scanning electron microscopy is slightly different because we are not sectioning the the the, the sample, but um, we just free deep um, flash freeze the sample put it inside the microscope, and we look at the surface of the microscope. But the outcome, it's quite amazing. So all the images that, uh, every single image, even a simple piece of glass, can be really, really cool under the microscope, under the, the scanning microscopy. And this is, again, only surface. You won't have any idea of what's underneath the tissue, the outside tissue. But still gives you quite a lot of... Uh, <clears throat> of information. Okay, um, again, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the, those, this is, uh, it's uh, all the, this, the next couple, couple of slides are uh, on their hands out. And it's just for me to give you example of applications, right? Um, one application, one very common application is the wound healing. So this is from focal microscopy. What we did, we took a, a, a glass, um, a cell culture dish, we scratched on the middle, and then we look at it in the microscope overnight, and uh, and then we looked at the migration of the cells throughout the scratch. So confocal microscopy in live conditions, uh, you can have. Uh, uh, viability ass assays, where you determine whether the cell is dead or not by using uh, uh, dyes, uh, um, viable dyes. Um, calcium flux, this is actually quite a cool application where you basically treating with calcium dyes, so the dyes are st sticking with the calcium, and whenever you see calcium flux, there is a signal in there, and then you can determine in live conditions where the calcium is going and uh, what's the meaning of that. Uh, cage release, pretty much a similar approach. Polarization is pretty much the same, so I want to polarize or depolarize in case of muscle, uh, uh, skeletal muscle or cardio myos, card, um, uh, cardiac muscles um, uh, studies. When you want to depolarize or repolarize membranes, uh, and uh, photo bleaching, uh, you can artificially bleach a sample and then recover the sample out of X amount of minutes, and this will tell you the property of that uh, um, compound that is being linked with the with the dye that is recovering. <coughs> okay. I want to spend just extra five minutes or seven minutes into what I think is quite important. <clears throat> Sorry for being late, but <clears throat> so 
Um, when we, you, when, we, when we observe something, our observations can be uh, subject to discussions because I can see that one being uh, moving to a specific uh, direction and then uh, behaving somehow in a specific way, whereas you can tell me, no, I don't agree because this goes in this way and so forth. So uh, <clears throat> our eyes are always sub subject to um, different uh, um, properties of uh, specifically on the contrast and uh, on the orientation of light that are different between me, you, 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 and so forth. So in order to clarify what we see and uh, give uh, a specific value or specific meaning of our a scientific result through microscopy, we need to measure it. So I'm going to go through a couple of funny examples of where your eyes can misjudge what you see. Your, your microscope image can be misjudged by a simple artifact of the light or a simple uh, missetting of, of whatever other things. This is probably quite cool. I mean, quite known, um, <clears throat> and it basically shows you that the two uh, uh, segments in the middle are, they look different, but they are actually the same. This sudden illustration shows you that, you see this? This can be a bunny or a duck. And this is the newer version, but still. <clears throat> so, again, a misinterpretation or a different interpretation from between me and you can be crucial, especially if it's not me, but it's your boss and you. So, it's always good to be careful on the interpretation. So, this is, what do you think is this? A fish? And this is a bird, uh, but it's a bird. Right? So, uh, this, is, this is another one. It's not a movie. It's not a GIF. You see moving it. Okay? I don't think you got any drugs so far, so... This is the same, right? Again, I swear it's not a GIF, it's not a, a, a movie. It's just a simple two-dimensional image, right? I should have hid hide this one, but anyways, so. Bottom line is that <clears throat> be very, very careful when you are analyzing your data in microscopy, in any discipline, but in microscopy particularly, because what you see is not necessarily what, you, what it is. Okay? And that's why the imaging analysis kicks in. I'm not going into so many details, but I just want to show you a couple of major softwares that well, we, we use in microscopy to analyze the data. You take an image, <clears throat> then you load in one of those softwares, and then uh, you process it by counting, by measuring the distance, the morphology, uh, segmenting, and so forth. So imaging analysis is crucial and it's always need to be together with the imaging acquisition, <clears throat> okay? Right, so this is the final uh, slide. Um, five to five. I am uh, available anytime, roughly, uh, in the, for questions if you need. I'm on the eighth floor, room 811. Yes. If you need any help on images, if you want to know more about it, just 
drop me a line or show up. I'll be there. Happy to help. And uh, I, I believe we'll see, I'll see you next week with the fact sorting uh,